This man is going to be calling the game with Iron Eagle on Westwood One Radio, uh, one of my favorites. I've known you for years, sir. Good to see you, Mike Mayock. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me, man. Thanks for coming by. Absolutely. And it's, this, the beautiful thing about how we know each other, so I was chatting with you yesterday about, about today and appearing on the show, and you called me in the commercial break of the World Series. Like the only way you were going to answer the phone if I, <laughs> if I called you during a commercial. The phone rings, I see it's you. I'm like, hey, Mike, you're like, I knew how to call you in a commercial break. <laughs> I would have, no, I, I pick up for you. But that was pretty intense last night. You, were, you watched the yeah, game seven? I think if you're a sports fan, any major event has to draw you. Oh, sure. And, and I sat there and watched that kid pitch the last five innings and was just in awe. And, and I don't care what sport it is. When you see a guy under the biggest of circumstances right. play as well as he can play, I get chills. I thought yeah. it was cool. And they were talking about how his his road to oh. success, Bumgarner, yeah, and, yeah. and how people you know, were sort of telling him what to do professionally. It's like any sport. You draft a kid and then you send him in baseball to single A. And what they said on television last night, which I thought was really interesting, was they tried to tr change his delivery. Like he's throwing darts with that delivery, and they didn't like it. They tried to make it more conventional, right. and he got lit up his first two starts in single A and basically said, okay, if I'm going to fail, it's going to be my way. Mm -hmm. And it, now he's become one of the best pitchers in baseball. It's really awesome to see. You played baseball at BC. Did you I not like Mayock? I did. What did you, you play? Played uh, outfield and first base. I was left-handed. And how... What was your game? What was the Mike Mayock BC game? If you ask my dad, who was my high school football coach, he okay. would tell you that baseball was my best sport. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a true story. He he thought I, I would have been drafted for baseball out of high school had I not signed a football letter of intent. Most of the teams called me the night before the draft my senior year in high school and said, hey, if we draft you tomorrow, what are you going to do? Right. I said, I'm going to Boston College to play football. So, my, And my dad was just shaking his hand like, you're stupid. It's a longer career path. You're a better player. Your skill set matches up. Why are you playing football? Right. And the answer was because I love it. And yet you got drafted. Not not very highly. <laughs> well, listen, you got drafted, right, by the Giants, the Steelers, Steelers right? The yeah. Steelers got yeah. you. Who yeah. was in that locker room when you first walked in that Steelers locker room? Walking in that locker room was uh, it was the draft of 1981, so they were about a year and a half removed from that fourth Super Bowl team, and everybody was still there. So you walked in, and on the defense, I, I had to get in a room with Donnie Shell, Mel Blunt. Mel Blunt was 6'4", 215-pound yeah. corner, yeah. and they changed the rules. Yeah. The bump rules in those days because of this guy. Talked this. about this with Rod Woodson on yesterday's did, show. Oh, did you? Yeah. He's saying that Rod said the first time he met him, like, no wonder they changed the rules yeah. for you. And I, I had the same reaction when I met him at the Hall of Fame, when he was a head and shoulder above Bruce Smith standing next to him. He still looks like he could line up and play bump yeah. corner. But yeah. that locker room was mm -hmm. nuts. Donnie Schell and he, uh, Jack Lambert, Mean Joe Green, Terry Bradshaw, Swan, uh, Stallworth, John Cole, Mike Webster, Franco Harris. Mm -hmm. And I'm from Eastern Pennsylvania, and I walk into into Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and I was just like a like I felt like I walked into to a living, working Hall of Fame. Yeah. Because it was. It really it was. It really was. Yeah. And then you wound up with, I, I didn't expect to get into story time, but it is a fascinating story. You wound up with the Giants, and your first position coach was at at at, uh, at special teams. Oh, uh, well, was, was, in special teams, Bill Belichick. Was Bill yeah. Belichick. Yeah. yeah. One of the reasons I made the Giants is because he was not just in those days, he was the linebacker coach and the special teams coach. So right. he was always looking for guys who could do more than one thing. So I could back up both safeties and play on all the special teams. And the way special teams coaches look at that is you might save a roster spot. How would Belichick describe you? <laughs> uh, he would say that I probably got the most out of my abilities. And, and perhaps if I had stayed healthy, I could have played eight to 10 years in that league just in that type of role. So like a typical Belichick player, in other words, playing, the, know. you know, you know, I mean, seriously, when you think about it, what this what this guy does and what he's been doing in New England and how like perfect example, we talked about this earlier in the week. Alan Branch signed this week, a key mayors traded for last week. Yeah. We know how well he does situational football, how yeah. well these players do yeah. situational football, yeah. down and down, in the moment, balls in the ground. They always have somebody on yeah. it while the other teams are strolling around not thinking right. that that's a live ball. He likes situational rostering week to week. Yeah. You know, well, this week we need this guy yep. because we're playing this opponent. Yep. I don't know. Does anyone else do that in the league? I don't know. If, uh, there probably are others, but yeah, it just I, seems I, that... I just think he's one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life, regardless of 
profession. He could, he could be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Uh, he could introduce uh, the Fed and talk about interest rates and, and everything else. He, he could do anything he want, and I'll tell you what he's best at. The mm -hmm. best thing I've ever seen him is at his core and at his heart, he's a teacher. And he could teach every position on the field, not every head coach, because some guys are, quote, defensive guys sure. or offensive guys. He could coach every single position on a football Quarterback? field. Quarterback? Every single position on a football field. Interesting. I'd, I'd never heard that about him. I mean, I've heard so many things about him. So he could be a quarterback's coach in the National Football League in your full estimation. Every single position. I, I, I watched them practice the year they went 16-0. and 0, Yeah. And they were getting ready to play Miami towards the end of the year, and it was an awful Miami team. And he made them practice in the snow. And all the players were grumbling about it. And Tom Brady was trying to – he had a towel and was wiping off the football because it was snowing and it was 20 degrees. And Belichick walked over to Brady and said, what, well, you got a problem? You can't throw a wet football? Mm -hmm. And he got the he, trainer and he said, listen, we're going to use that ball the rest of the day, Tom. You just throw that ball. No. And, and Brady looked at him like he was going to shoot him. And then it, from, from the next hour, Rich, it looked like it was the middle of June and Tom Brady was showing him how good he was. The ball didn't hit the ground. He wouldn't let anybody – the ball was wet. It, was, it looked like a grade school ball you and I would play within the backyard. Sure. And it was, un I mean, he sat there and he and Brady talked about how you throw a wet ball. I mean, it, he can coach any position. Now it looks like it's supposed, it could snow for the New England Denver mm. game on Sunday. It looks like there could, there's inclement weather coming right. Right. for Sunday and, and Brady and Manning playing the position again, even mm -hmm. though what we saw earlier this year, w New England, what, what do we make of the six and two Patriots so far this year? The first four or the, the last four? I, I think that the earmarks of a Belichick team is it gets better every day, you know, and it might not be real good early. And there's no way in the world that team should have won 12 games a year ago. I thought that was one of his best coaching jobs. And I also thought it was one of Tom Brady's best years, even though his numbers were down. I thought the two of them pulled and dragged them to a 12-win record. And I think what you're seeing this year is they're getting a little bit better every day. And all of a sudden, Gronkowski gets healthy, and they look like, like a different team offensively. They signed Tim Wright, athletic tight end. Who does that remind you of? You know, they're just getting a little in that offensive line where they're trying to integrate two new young players into it is getting better. Mm -hmm. What do you make of the whole Romo deal in Dallas right now with him coming back in the game? People are wondering if he should have been able to talk himself back into the game. Yeah. Where do you stand on that subject, Mike? I have mixed emotions, but, but typically um, he's the man. He's the guy, and if the doctor says he can play and he can play at his normal level and Tony Romo feels like he can play at, at close to his normal level, you probably defer to him mm -hmm. like you would any major starting quarterback with a track record. The, the guy's got a track record, you know, so uh, even though the backup, Whedon, had just put 10 points on the he board in, in two possessions. He looked pretty good. And in, in spurts, he can. Sure. You know, he just right. hasn't gotten it done consistently. But I, I, they're a fun team to watch right now, Dallas, because maybe Rod Marinelli's doing as good a job as any coach in football with that defense. It's a no-name defense. They got cast-offs everywhere, and they're playing their tails off. And on offense, I think the heartbeat of that team is becoming the offensive line. And when that happens, usually you're pretty darn good. And they play uh, an Arizona team that is pretty darn good, too. And I know when is we're talking about guys who pay their dues and work their yep. way up. I mean, Arians yep. could win coach of the year again. Yep. I know there's so much football left to go, but with the, I just love that he took that shot to John Brown down the field. He's so aggressive, yep. just like Todd Bowles, who's who makes Arians look like a wallflower calling plays. Yep. And the question is, is how can these two got, how can these two coaches in this team keep moving forward? In that division yep. with a big opponent like Dallas this weekend. Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by that division because how good is Seattle going to be? And, and when are they going to get where we all hope they get to? Right. San Francisco, what are they? Uh, I think it's going to be a heavy, a prize heavyweight fight all the way to the end. I don't think anybody's winning 13 games in that division, including Arizona. And if you look at their defensive losses through suspension and injury, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. What Todd Bowles has done with this defense they're number five in points allowed. What he's done is outstanding. 
you're 100% on with Arians. I've known him since he coached Temple back in, at, in Temple. Philadelphia 20-some years ago. He had a chip on his shoulder then. <laughs> He, he had a chip on his shoulder in Pittsburgh. He, everywhere he's gone, he's had a chip on his shoulder, and his players play their tails off for him. They really, so he and Bowles, they're, they're outstanding, and I don't know what's going to happen in that division. I just know it's going down to the last week. It's exciting. What yeah. about tonight? What do you think about tonight's game here? Boy, it, <laughs> it's been a brutal division. You know, I mean, they don't have a winning team in this whole division. So uh, these are the two teams. One of these two teams has to step up and make a statement tonight. I would anticipate it looks like it should be New Orleans. Uh, they played well last week. Um, you look at Carolina, they got three offensive linemen out. You know, if I told you before the season started that there's some Frenchman that's going to play left yeah, tackle, right. whose name I can't even pronounce. He's 63. Foucault? 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 No, it's Foucault. Oh. Foucault. Is that like seven syllables? Is yeah, no, no, but it's, uh, it's. I just taught you French, by the way. You Thank just had a French well, lesson here, Mike. I thought it was a haiku. <laughs> well, and I know Foucault. in Philadelphia. I know. I know in Philadelphia, <laughs> speaking French means something completely different. Exactly right. <laughs> South of France means something different, also. <laughs> 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 yeah, but Foucault is I mean, the one who's coming tonight. I mean, Foucault's starting at left tackle. The yeah. other rookie that nobody's ever heard of is starting at left guard. Right. There's another uh, – Velasco starting at right. It's like the United Nations is starting up front. Right. And you know, they struggled last week against Seattle. Uh -huh. And if Cam Newton can't get off in the planned quarterback run game, I think it's going to be a long day for them. And, and i got to ask you, too, Notre Dame deserves to be in the top four, you think? I don't care right now. You know, no, I mean, they got to take care of their business. And, and I think the reason they release rankings right now is so that we all talk about it. And sure. But the SEC is going to cannibalize itself. Most of these conferences are going to cannibalize each other. And Notre Dame's just got to keep their mouth shut and keep winning. And at the end of the day, if they're 11 and 1, then we'll have that conversation. They, they are a very stout football team. I mean, when, they, are, they are as tough as I've seen them in a very, very well, long time. When that quarterback is on and when yeah. he doesn't turn the football over, they're very special. Um, obviously, they didn't play great against North Carolina or Syracuse or Purdue, but they were all wins. And I know another thing that you're not, you're, you're so far away, because I know you, I know you, I know what you, what you focus on and how you, you do your business, but if I had asked you the first overall pick in the draft next year would be, right now, as you and I are sitting here. I, who's declared? Let's say... <laughs> Let's say let's say you're every, not getting an answer let's out say of me. Everybody got, that we think will declare. You got will declare. zero shot of getting an answer out of me on this because I have no idea who's declaring and not declaring. It's way too early. I think one of the things we're going to end up talking ad nauseum every year. It seems like there's one guy. We, yeah. Last year it was Manziel. Before that it was Tebow. I mean, this year it's going to be the Florida State kid. Yeah. You know, it's going to and be. all the stuff off the field that's happened with the NFL oh, yeah. and how much it impacts the first draft class is going to be fascinating. I just that is absolutely we just you just ba this is exactly what we're going to talk about when the combine Rich, Rich I know you and I know where you were go trying to steer me with that yes, question. But you still did give me something. A tiny bit. You did. <laughs> Mike, you're the man. Same Have man. a great cast with Iron Eagle yeah, tonight. My Iron pleasure. Eagle, I think, is going to be joining me later on on this uh, uh, show. This is the man right here, Mike Mayock. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern. On Audience. <laughs>